Hey guys, John here with another video tutorial. Uh, this one is going to be the painting of a, I guess a skeleton warrior kind of portrait. Uh, I sped the video up a little bit. I think it's about 1.5 times faster than what I actually did. So it's not lightning fast. You can still see what's going on, but it's not, um, I didn't want it to be too long of a video. Much like the last video, which was over two hours. I felt like that was probably informative, but way too long. So what I did here is, uh, I have a skull reference. I took a picture of it in my hand with the jaw open because I wanted this kind of, uh, something kind of like this angle of uh, the, the skull head with the jaw open of a skeleton warrior, kind of undead character. And so it's kind of what I tried to do here. I think using reference is really important and if you can create your own reference, even better. Um, I had this skull laying around and I kind of wanted to paint something like this, so I thought, why not? But using reference is really important. It really helps you create something that's, I think, accurate to real life. And, uh, I don't know, it's just, um, for me, it's it just helps a lot. I know there's a lot of artists out there that don't really need reference, and usually that's because they studied a lot of things already based on references. So they already have a, a vast library of, of knowledge stored away in their head as far as anatomy or whatever it is that they don't need reference for. That they can just create out of thin air. But I always think it's a good idea to have it. So what I'm doing here is um, I have like a medium gray background. I made a new layer on top of it and turned the layer blending mode to multiply. And I use black to paint in a uh, value and I press X to switch to white to paint out the value and um, I try to reduce the opacity of the layer back down to about uh, I think it's about 70% that's just kind of what I feel comfortable with and so I just kind of view it as sculpting in black and white I just kind of use the black to start of sort of push values in and then uh, the white to kind of sculpt the values out until I get something re you know relatively what I want um, so, yeah. So here I'm just paying attention to the, the lighting of, and I didn't really do anything special with the lighting. I probably should have, but it's okay. I, I just, I needed some kind of reference here for this. And I had the skull laying around, so it seemed like a good idea. Um, and I, I don't know enough about skulls and anatomy, I think, to just make a skull off the top of my head. I've tried that before in the past, and generally when I, when I do that, and I know when a lot of people do that, they'll make something and um, they'll base it off of what they think it is, but they haven't studied enough in order to warrant that, to make it sort of uh, worth it, to, or that, that they can just create from memory something that's going to be believable. It's a lot more, con you know, anatomy or whatever it is you're drawing is oftentimes a lot more complex than what you remember and sometimes you can get away with it um i remember dave raposa one of my favorite artists mentioning how you know um sometimes when you're creating something it's really good idea to not look at reference and try and think of like the nostalgic sort of how your mind mentally interprets it because sometimes we um we think something is in our head is a lot cooler than what it actually is and sometimes that works out and so if you know you want to give that a shot sometime go for it uh, for me though I want to make sure I, I don't feel confident enough to do that um, that's probably a good exercise to try but I don't feel confident I don't feel confident in doing that myself really quite yet as an artist I don't feel like I'm talented enough to do that and I don't feel like I have the the mental repository of knowledge uh, regarding various subjects in order to do that. Maybe on certain things, but on most things, no. Especially things like armor. Um, I always have, I always struggle with armor. On this one, I didn't use armor as reference because I, I kind of had a, an idea in mind of what I wanted to do, and it was relatively simple, but sometimes more complex medieval armors get a little tricky, so I have to look at reference for that. And obviously the skull as well. Um, lots of little nooks and crannies, protrusions, and surfaces that create the shape of the skull and I didn't want to try and guess at it because that's inevitably what I would end up doing 
and people can tell when they see your art and it's um they can tell that you guessed at something they might not know exactly that the anatomy or the perspective or whatever it is that you guessed at is necessarily off they might not be able to pinpoint that but something will always look off in the image and uh it's i don't know it's they may not be able to articulate what it is that's wrong and maybe you can't either you maybe you finish the painting and you're like man something is just not right and i can't figure out what it is exactly and it's probably something that you guessed at that at the time when you were drawing it you thought that's how it worked but it's actually not how it works so i didn't want to fall into that trap with that so that's what i that's why i used reference here so you can see the there's a lot of tilation of the texture for the brush i'm using which is kind of annoying but i usually end up kind of massaging that out of the image anyways so bear with me there yeah it looks pretty awful but it it'll get better uh it, it'll get fixed so now I'm just working on the armor pieces, trying to use line work to... I like to do a mix of, of painting shapes and lines. Uh, lines are a, kind of a weakness for me, and I definitely feel more... Well, actually, just starting with basic shapes is even tricky for me, too. It's it's some For me, it's somewhere in between of working with line and shapes, uh, opaque shapes and blending them out and back in and all that kind of stuff. So... Excuse me while I get a drink of water here. One thing I don't do enough here in this image probably is rotate the image back and forth. Um, I think it's really important to uh, flip your canvas a lot, uh, mirror it, do whatever you, you know, flip it upside down and work on it. It helps you see other mistakes and issues that maybe don't look right or compositional issues that look weird. Uh, because your eyes get used to looking at it one way, so mistakes start to kind of uh, blur together. And so if you start, or you get used to the mistakes and you don't notice them anymore, they just kind of become part of the normal. And uh, and so flipping the canvas is a good way of getting fresh eyes on it. So here I made a new layer on top of my kind of uh, really basic sketch where on the multiply layer, and this is just a normal layer. And now I'm starting to add in lighter values, so I'm using like a white, I'm still working in grayscale. I'm using like a white to kind of reinforce the surfaces and the planes and all that kind of stuff that I'm trying to uh, create here on the on the image. And so I'm just I'm looking at my reference and I'm trying to match that as closely as possible. I don't quite have the perspective right, as you can probably see. I think my skull is his head is looked a little too much to the right, and I don't have as much of a looking up angle like kind of underneath the skull uh, view as in my reference image it's almost like a you know that foreshortened uh, perspective of the skull and I think that's just because that's tricky and, and that's something I probably need more practice with but um, you know it is what it is it turned out the image the final image looks well enough I think too so and here I'm just messing with the teeth Teeth are always something I kind of struggle with. I usually don't put much detail into teeth um, just because they are kind of tricky. So I generally just use uh, very loose brush strokes to imply that shape uh, of, the, of the teeth in a mouth or something like that. Considering it's a skeleton and it doesn't have the flesh around the, the mouth in order to hide a lot of the teeth, uh, it makes it a little more difficult. So you have to spend a little more time on the teeth, but you know, I'm, I'm still just trying to imply, uh, imply things where I can. I kind of wanted to give it uh, kind of glowy eyes in there too, you can see. And I eventually end up, I had the pupils in there and I thought it just kind of looked weird. So then I got rid of them. I think just having the glowing eyes made it look better. But, you know, it's just an example of trying something doesn't work. Try something different. Um, let's see if you can you can do better. And I eventually get it rid of these like scraggly hairs and stuff like that that uh, are on his skull. I just make it a clean kind of like bleached stone, bleached stone, bleached bleached bone uh, look. 
And as you can see too, because I'm, I'm adding multiple layers and painting in different directions, I'm starting to get rid of that tiling of the brush texture. Um, this brush that I'm using, I don't remember where I downloaded it from. It's someone else's brush. I don't remember exactly where I got it from. But it works really well on smaller details. On these larger details, like painting a large background or something like that, it doesn't work that great. I would probably, I should probably actually use a different brush, but I also really like the texture that it gives. It gives it a real painterly texture to things, and so that's why I kind of sketch with it. I don't know. It's just what I like. I eventually switched to a hard round brush. Um, I guess I should take a moment to talk about brushes. I know I've talked about brushes in the past, but I think there's a lot of misconception about brushes. Um, you should be able to work or create a, at least, I think, a semi-decent piece of art with whatever brush is available to you. So, you know, you don't... I think having textured brushes and, you know, brushes that have mechanical stamped shapes that you can kind of stamp stuff in, that's great, and it's useful for, you know, speeding up the process and all that kind of stuff, but at the end of the day, I think as a good practice, it's oftentimes a, a really good thing to limit yourself to one or two brushes for a painting uh, as an exercise. And um, that's kind of what I did with this one here. I kind of limi limited myself to this really textury brush, and I believe just the hard round, and that's all I use in the entire painting. And um, it's just a good mental exercise to try and solve problems. Because that's what we're doing here with this painting. We're continually solving problems throughout the, pro the creation process until we get it to how we like it. Um, <clears throat> but it's good to try and solve those problems with a, very, a limited tool set because it makes you start thinking about fundamentals and, and all that kind of stuff more than just like, well, now I use my grass brush and now I use my leaves brush and then I use my whatever brush and then I use my... Um, rock brush like you, when you're painting traditionally you don't really at least for me when I work traditionally I don't have access to stuff like that I gotta I gotta use a dagger brush or the I mean there's a you know like a flat brush or a fan brush or a round brush you know really fine detailed brushes and stuff so, so there's variation but it's less variation than what you have with Photoshop um, and I think that's partly what gives you know, for a lot of people, uh, with their work, you looks it looks like an illustration, obviously, but it's looks very there's a digital feeling to it, and I think it's because there's options available in Photoshop that aren't available in real life. Um, but I don't know. I, I just think it's a good exercise to maybe for like one or two paintings every once in a while try and limit yourself within certain parameters and try and solve that problem with those limited tools rather than everything open to you. On the flip side, it's oftentimes really beneficial, I think, to uh, switch brushes a lot. I've done that before too because it's constantly refreshing your mind. You have a new tool, how can I apply this tool and get an interesting result? So it's two sides of the same coin and I think both are valid exercises. I'm not going to say one way is better than the other. I think they're both useful towards uh, developing your mind to solve these artistic problems in different ways. So that's the, whole, that's the whole purpose of that, I think. So here I'm starting to add color. I use uh, overlay layers or soft light layers. I don't really generally use the color layer. Um, I know some people like to try and color their paintings with the color layer, and I just find it to be boring. I don't know. It's, there's something wrong about it. I like some of these ones you can see here where I play with the shadows because I like to have color in my shadows. I don't like to just use, I think it's oftentimes a big mistake and often flattens out paintings and makes them look really amateurish, is when they when people just use black in the shadows or they have one light source and it's just black shadows and light source. Like it's, to me, um, I mean, I guess unless you're working in grayscale only and you're just trying to work on studying value, which is separate from color, uh, but I just find it way more useful to use something where, like here, 
my shadows aren't pure black. There's a hint of purple in them. And to me, that just, I think it helps give it a more 3D effect. Uh, and it helps it to, I don't know, just look more interesting to me than just having these flat black shadows. Because black just ends up flattening everything. Um, you have these large, it look, ends up looking more graphical. Which, if that's the style you're going for, then more power to you. But, you know, generally I'm trying to make a real painterly, 3D-esque and not graphical image. And, um, and so that it doesn't it doesn't work well in the finished product. It makes the lighting look weird. It makes the everything look just look weird. So you can see here I'm I'm really trying to um, imply more of that purple in the eye sockets here around the glowing red eyes. And I'm gonna I'm gonna use that purple throughout in the shadows, a uh, purpley blue color, um, contrasted with the orangey yellow colors. Those are good complementary colors uh, in the in the painting here. I find that to be a lot more of an interesting, just a more interesting composition when you don't, you know, you have complementary colors like that working in light and shadow, using different colors in conjunction with value in order to get that carved sort of 3D look. And um, I don't know, I just, I just try and tell people as often as possible to steer away from black in your shadows as much as possible. I mean, sometimes it's warranted, um, but I feel like oftentimes for most beginners, if you can avoid using black in your shadows as often and as much as you possibly can, you'll end up with a better image generally. Um, try and fight that desire to make all your shadows black. So here I'm just using a lighter yellowy, uh, orangey color to uh, create the highlights and I think by this point I think I might have switched to the hard round brush or I'm, I'm, I switch back and forth a lot between the hard round and that textured brush uh, between the two but I'm just trying to catch I'm looking at my reference and I'm trying to catch the little subtle you look at a skull and you, and you look at the reference image that I have there and there's a lot of like a little little bumps there's a lot of uh, indentations and little imperfections on the surface of a skull and I find that you know I just talked about using value and color I find that mixing the values and colors together in order to imply that you can see here I'm adding some of that purpley color into the under the eye socket in the cheekbone area um, I find that using that those subtle color shifts and and surface to, to, to show those subtle surface changes oftentimes gives a really interesting effect and for me I felt like it helped it look more like this guy's made of bone to do that and that was through value and color and you know accurate mark making where you know purposeful mark making where I want something to be um, so you know try and keep that in mind as well really look at the surface of what you're painting try and imagine uh, I think in my painting the head tutorial, which I should probably link to in this, it's probably very, very good to link to that video from a couple weeks ago where I painted a bust of the um, ancient Roman senator Cicero, where I talked about ray, you know, thinking about rays of light hitting a surface and at what angle those rays of light are hitting the surface that I'm painting of the human head, and the more perpendicular that surface is to the ray of light, the brighter and more highlighted that surface is going to be. The more extreme the angle and the less perpendicular that surface is, the more in shadow it will be. And so if you understand that concept and then mix in an, an interesting color into the um, more non-perpendicular surfaces that are in shadow, I think you can come with some really interesting results, which is always I think what we're trying to achieve as artists and painters, right? We want to achieve something cool and interesting and new. <clears throat> so here, yeah, you know, I'm just really trying to, I'm smoothing things out and then trying to go back and add texture. I'm working big, then working to smaller. And uh, I think that's always important. I'm probably spending a little too much time on the face here. Um, I think it's really beneficial to jump around your painting a little bit more 
I mean, I'm not going to tell you what to do. If you feel like you got to work from one area and fan out, which I totally understand, I, I feel like I have to do that sometimes on certain illustrations, then go for it. But for me, to bring the painting up as a whole in a rendered state, I feel like it's really useful to... Um, to, to jump around the painting a lot, jump to the background, jump to the foreground, you know, maybe jump to some armor pieces right now and kind of start fleshing those out, then getting stuck really focusing on the face. Mostly because you don't want to have, let's say you start someplace that's not the focal point. I, focal point. I start on the, the skeleton face, which is obviously the focal point of this painting. But let's say you start like on a random Thing in the background and you spend all this time illustrating out that extreme detail in this object in the background that obviously isn't that important uh, now the rest of your painting has to look that sharp or even more intense in detail than that one random object in the background because it won't match otherwise or you'll have two competing focal points in your painting and you don't want that because um, that's not an intentional thing and so it ends up just looking really off so I thought it'd be cool to add like these hellish red glow to the eyes but also have it inside the mouth as well I just thought that would look cool so that's what I'm doing here and um, I think I try to avoid using a color dodge layer as much as possible and trying to imply that glowing effect with more traditional painting techniques than using layer, blend, uh, layer blending modes, but I think I do actually use it. I might use a color dodge layer at the end just to kind of accentuate it, but not to totally achieve that effect as you can see. As you can see too, I'm um, you know, I'm trying to keep things in a really limited color palette as well. Um, it goes from the purpley blues to the red to the yellow, yellowy orange. And I'm kind of trying to keep everything in that spectrum. And you'll see even the armor um, for the leather pieces, I kind of add some brown in, or I, some purple in with uh, the goldish color in order to create a more brownish color and it looks and that's how I, you can achieve grays it's interesting um colors and i'm not an expert on color theory at all so take this for green you know what it's worth i could be completely off and wrong but i think it's interesting how and i've noticed this like and i've noticed this more when, when i'm painting traditionally in oils or acrylics or something like that is you'll be painting and you're like, oh, okay, I need to paint. I'll, I'll be painting like a landscape. I'll do a, I'll be doing a plein air painting. And I'll be painting a landscape. And um, I'll see that I'm using lots of blues and browns, let's say. And I find that if I mix, for instance, the blues and the browns and maybe add a little like yellow ochre or something like that into the, the color, I can get something that's not really green by itself it's not really that green by itself but uh when it's in the painting itself next to other colors in the painting it kind of tricks the eye it, it tricks your eyes into thinking that it's that color it's it's like those optical illusions almost and um i kind of discovered this accidentally i don't know exactly how to achieve it every time um so that's kind of difficult for me but it's an interesting thing that when I see it, I'm like, ooh, I gotta remember that these colors do this. Um, and in this case, you know, mixing like a, a mid purple with a, you know, a brown color creates an interesting grayish, um, could be good metallic col color in this, um, in this composition. And so, you know, that's a that's an interesting thing to stow away in your head when you're playing with colors that that that's a possibility that 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 can happen I think too often as artists um, you'll see it's kinda like the black thing you make the assumption that like oh the shadows are black 
and then you you see a plant and it's green you're like oh well the plant's green so i just got to get this ugly gross saturated overly saturated green and throw it in there and like look it's a plant and it gives it just gives paintings like a weird feeling that you can tell the person didn't really know what they were doing um and so it's it's interesting to me that when you're you're almost you're not you're not exactly copying the colors you're you're faking them in a way by mixing them with certain other, you know other colors or putting them next to other colors so that it tricks the eye the eyes into thinking that it's that color i don't know that's interesting to me that that's possible um and it's definitely something i need to study and and look into more uh going forward because it's definitely a neat little trick that um i think gives your painting some more professional and thought out look where it's like you know in that it's interesting take like a, a, ma a ma do a master study and color pick from the master study i know i i know i say don't do that but you're not going to be replicating it in this instance so open photoshop and have a master painting open and color pick a color that what you think it is and then draw it into a new canvas like on a white or a medium gray background and you'll see it like whoa that color when it's by itself looks completely different than when it's in the painting as a whole and then you can kind of see how you can probably reverse engineer uh, those effects with color and trick eyes into thinking that trick people's eyes into thinking that a color you know is purple when in reality it's it's not purple at all you know it's a it's a totally different color when it's by itself but because it's next to these other colors it looks purple um, that would be something that I think would be a really interesting exercise to do. I've, I've done it a couple of times in the past, and it's kind of interesting. It kind of blows your mind when you're like, oh, this this sky is definitely blue. I'm going to color pick this part of the sky, and then you paint it in, and you're like, oh, weird. It's it's like a... It's not blue. It's, it's like a greenish color almost when it's by itself, but it looks blue when it's in the painting. That's so bizarre because it's next to this color in the painting. Um, it's just, you know, really... I don't know, that really interests me. Little nuanced sort of uh, things that can really, I think, level up your your abilities in your painting and the way things look. So here I actually jumped to the background and my initial idea was to have the background be um, a forest of some kind and I eventually ended up changing it to ruins just because I couldn't get these trees to work fun or function properly as trees it was a little annoying but in the end the the faint i think the faint look of ruins in the background where it's not the background is just essentially shapes there's not much fine detail back there it works better because it makes the it makes the detail on the skull look even more detailed than it actually is by comparison i think another little i think visual trick that you can try All right, so finally I rotate the image. I should have been doing this way more often and not at this point in the video where, you know, I'm over, I'm definitely over halfway through the painting and I'm just barely flipping it. I do notice some issues with the straps though, which I'm trying to fix here. And this is what I'm talking about where I add some purpley browns together to try and make like a grayish color, which by comparison of everything else around it, it makes it look gray, and I think it's because, you know, it's a purpley, adding that, that purple shadowy color with the with the gray almost saturates the image a little bit, um, or the color a little bit, where, you know, it is closer to gray. It's closer to gray than anything else around it, so, you know, by comparison, it looks gray. So that's my, I guess, my personal theory as to how that works. But yeah, here I'm just trying to Put some details into these leather straps that would hold up the the breastplate have the chain mail on underneath um which i think i end up changing from chain mail to just cloth um i think it just seemed like it was going to be too much uh to to do chain mail i have a brush that i use which i think i try using it here probably um i just so i try and break out to a third brush where it's like a series of rings that overlap each other and it could it sometimes makes for a good chainmail brush so you do one layer of it with a um 
the darker color, then you add, you, you know, you use it like any other brush, but it has like this texture to it where it's a bunch of rings linked together. And um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I think if I use it here in this video, I don't remember, uh, I change it because it didn't work out very well, I think. So here I'm just trying to think of the lighting and how it would affect this uh, cloth around its neck. The lighting is obviously coming from the, uh, and since I rotated it here, the top left, uh, our top left. And so how would that affect underneath uh, on that cloth that's wrapped around its neck? It's probably not entirely accurate, but I'm trying to think about that. I'm not just randomly painting light. That's one thing that I, I notice in a lot of beginners work too is, um, and I, I've seen it before with photo bashing as well. When people try and get into photo bashing, they don't know um, how to one, pick the right kind of photos and two, pick photos that work together in the scene that they're trying to bash together. And, um, you know, they have like all these conflicting light sources all over the place, which just makes a visually confusing mess for the, for the viewer and for you as you, you'll, you'll finish your painting and you'll be like m most that are artists that are self-conscious that make that mistake, but don't understand exactly what it is. We'll look at their painting and be like, this is odd. Um, this part, I mean, it's rendered well, probably, but something's off. It just doesn't look right. And people will probably feel the same way. They'll be like, wow, this is really good, but there's just something weird and, and off about it. And they might not understand how uh, the lighting is just, you know, you have three different shadows and it doesn't make sense. You know, you have a shadow going to the, the left here and a shadow going to the right here. And then this shadow is going straight backwards and it just makes a confusing mess and it doesn't it doesn't work um i've seen that before i've been the victim of that myself and the reason why i say photo bashing is because they bash in one photo let's say of a mountain and the lighting's coming from the top right and then they bash in another photo of the mountain because it's you know similar in color it's similar in tone and, and value but the lighting's coming from the left and they don't ever think to either rotate it so that or mirror it so that the writing's also the lighting's also on the right or paint over the top heavily in order to reinforce it like it's it's coming from the other side so you, then you you have this background uh, where there's maybe mountains in the background and they're bashed in from photos and one mountain looks like the lighting is coming from a very hard right position and the other mountain looks like it's coming from a very hard left position and those will fight each other and that won't make any sense and it's a subtle thing but it, it's subtle enough to where I think people can who don't again they're not artistic and they don't know what's going on but we have a sense of um, we have a sense of how lighting works I think intuitively uh, where we might not be able to articulate it, but we we see that this this is odd. This isn't right. And I mentioned this before. I, I thought about this a while ago. Where I I have very vivid dreams, and I, to me it's really interesting how in my dreams they're very vivid, and the lighting looks correct. Like if there's a lamp in the room, like people are lit properly in the room, and the room is lit properly in my dream. Or if we're outside and the sun is behind us like the the scene makes sense in my dream and I thought about that and I'm like man I'm spending all this time studying when it's pretty clear that like subconsciously I do understand how lighting works and where lighting should go and how it should be you know um so it's just I've been trying to think of a way like how can I I mean maybe that's what it is through um practice is that you're aligning your conscious mind with what you subconsciously already know and understand because again I feel like some people look at paintings and they're like this looks good but again there's something off and I don't know what it is um, and it doesn't take it takes someone who's well trained or who's studied a lot to look at it and be like oh well you know what's off is you have two conflicting light sources and they don't work well with each other or you know this a net piece of anatomy is off and what, whatever it may be so um, that's another thing too is is the you know you can close your eyes and you can envision someone and the anatomy makes sense the anatomy is accurate in your imagination but perhaps the practicing comes from getting the um, muscle memory and the 
uh, dexterity to translate from your memory, from your imagination, what your mind has an easy time, I think, creating, which is really amazing and powerful in and of itself, to something tangible and real, like a painting, or a sketch, or a digital painting, or something like that. So, <clears throat> that's my little uh, metaphysical spiel on art, I guess, that I've kind of been thinking about lately. Yeah, so here I I got most of the chess piece done. I got the f you know as you can as you see here I change it from chainmail to fabric just for the sake of ease. Uh, it wasn't looking right to me, so I was like, whatever, you know, just chainmail's not working. Change it. <laughs> you know, this is a personal painting. It it's not like I'm work doing this for a client where they demand chainmail on the skeleton warrior. Um, it can be whatever I want it to be. So at least there's that freedom with that. I don't know what I would do if it was a client piece and they asked for chainmail and I didn't, you know, I was struggling with that. I guess I would look at um, chainmail more closely and I'd probably just have to end up spending more time on that spot if I was really struggling with it. Again, I mean, I, I painted this painting in about an hour, so, I mean, that's not a full day's work at all. So I guess if a client asked, you know, I, I would have more time probably to to uh, make sure that the chainmail looked proper. Oftentimes when I'm given a contract from, say, Mongoose Publishing for their Traveler RPG or something like that, like I usually get a few weeks for a few paintings, so that means that I get a lot of time to really sit and think about how I'm going to attack a, an idea or a painting and make it work properly. So here I'm trying to make the breastplate look like it wraps around his body a little bit more and under the armpits there and on the front like how it has some curvature to it. I didn't want it to look like this flat piece of steel on his chest. It's not very effective armor if he does that. And I'm going to just start adding a little bit of decoration to it, you know. Um, I think I end up using a tilt shift to blur some of that out, but it still, still makes for an interesting piece or idea, I guess. So, I think I'm pretty much done here. It's just a few minute details um, of just fleshing out some, some slight subtle changes in the, the bone texture. And because that's the focal point, focal point, that's what everyone's going to be looking at is this glowing, flaming skull head, you know, with it looks like embers or hellish glow on the inside of it. That's what everyone's going to be looking at, so I want to make sure that that's, you know, the way I want it to look. Um, so I think I'm pretty much done here. I think it's just a few final tweaks here. I want to encourage you guys to follow me on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash John Torres Art. For $1, uh, you can support the channel and help make it self-sustaining. That's really helpful. Um, and for five dollars you get access to all the files uh, anything like that so you'll have access if you spend five dollars or more you'll have access to the um, PSD file for this or if it's you know one of my blender tutorials you'll have access to the blend file or something like that where you can open it up and see exactly what I did and and see the finished product which I think is obviously immensely helpful if you're trying to learn I always appreciate when I do look at someone else's tutorial and they have those files, original files, available. So I can open it up and inspect it myself and uh, see from a different angle exactly what they did. So <clears throat> for $1, you support the channel. Thank you. For $5, you get access to my files and all that extra goodies, all the extra goodies like that. You can also follow me on uh, Twitter at uh, John Torres Art. And my own personal portfolio site is JohnTorresArt.com. Um, if you go to my Gumroad and just follow me, you can subscribe to my newsletter and also get notified when I post a new tutorial or anything like that. Um, that's all helpful and useful stuff for you to keep track of what I'm doing. And again, I'm trying to, I'm trying to roll out at least one video a week for everyone out there. And, uh, I want to make sure that there's at least one solid tutorial video that I release a week. So, you know, in a year, that's 52 tutorials and it adds up really quick. So 
If you appreciate this stuff, I'd really appreciate that uh, that Patreon support. So I think I'm gonna just tune out here, and you guys can finish watching the video. And it's it's pretty much done here. It's just a matter of uh, these finalizing, you know, pieces of uh, information that I gotta add. Anyways, thanks for watching, guys. I hope you have a great day. Hope you have a great weekend or weekday, whatever it is for you out there. Evening, morning, whatever it is. Thanks for watching, and I will catch you guys in my next video. See you guys later. Thank you.